Hello Internet. Now that Chapter 2 is out and my number of subscribers is up huh, higher than 4. People sometimes ask me, what do you think the next Dark World is gonna be like? But you know what I'm really wondering about as Chapter 2 comes to a close? What the heck is this space? No really. Why don't we transform when we first enter? Why does it have normal papers on the floor like this? If it's a dark world shouldn't they have transformed into something by now? And if it's not a dark world, why does it suck in the light from the hallway when we open it? Most of those questions can be answered by assuming that this dark world was freshly created, or perhaps you don't transform right away upon your first exposure, but then if that's the case, how did the creator of the first dark world get out? Is the storage closet special somehow? And if so, why? I might buy that this dark world is special, but it wouldn't explain why the door slams shut on you the first time you enter. It sorta seems like someone on the other side slammed it shut on us. Was it the mysterious night? Did they literally lock the door on us? If so, how did they even get the key? But first some quick disclaimers. Don't hassle people over the text-to-speech, just in general. You don't know why someone might need one and it can be rude and ableist to assume. This channel is about all the fun ways we can fit the pieces together, not to craft the one perfect theory. It's fine to disagree, in fact it's welcome. I'll love to see all the things I missed, or all the other ways we can look at things. So if you see a theory you think is ridiculous, please don't get so caught in this need to be right that you start acting rude to each other. Basically don't be a birdly. Spoiler warnings for Undertale and Deltarune, if you haven't played them, Go do that first. The idea that there are multiple dark worlds confined to different physical spaces wasn't very explorable before, but now that we have both the computer lab and unused classroom as reference points, we can start to draw comparisons between their physical real-world counterparts, and the worlds themselves. To begin with, the layout and tone of both rooms seems to parallel the world it creates. We enter through a great golden door. The Card Kingdom has a blocky, colorful, playful sort of vibe, which matches the theme of children's toys. There's a soft purple grass floor parallel by this carpet, blocky red Lego trees and walls, a checkerboard area that warps you back to the beginning if you don't follow the rules while you move across, bake sales, and animal cracker snacks, one of those soft squeaky toy hammers, etc. The card castle appears to be this cabinet, with each shelf representing a floor, and then the finale area on the roof, the cyber world, by contrast, has a very computerized vibe. You can see flashing lights, circuit-like dots and lines, plugs and ports, holographic displays, keyboard keys, cursors, etc. Unlike the card kingdom, the cyber world has cliffs and drops, likely due to the furniture you'd have to climb up and down to reach the various areas. The field of green is likely the carpeting, similar to the field in the previous chapter, we enter this big box here before traveling to the Cyber City, likely a reference to the Surge Protector, before reaching the computers on the tables. At the halfway point Queen drives us across the two tables possibly using local wireless, as she is a laptop. Note on this side we have bits of trash littering the table, and the computers are crashing and infected with malware, likely explaining these dolphin pop-ups and Vera Viracans. Once again the castle is a cabinet, but this time near the top there's little twinkling fairy lights likely referencing Noel's riding the Ferris wheel, this poster, with Susie. So then, with all of that in mind, I just have one question. Where in the hell are we? No seriously look at this, what is this landscape? I've seen supply closets, and I don't think I've ever seen them have blue-gray floors or dull fuchsia walls. The jumps and cliffs likely indicate shelving, which does check out, but what unholy liquid is pouring from these holes? Oil? Ink? Wait, this is a school supply closet why would it have those? Maybe it's black? Paint? And only black paint? Between the sound you hear before waking up and just the general aesthetic, it's almost easier to believe we're under the ocean than in a school closet. That would also square with the eye puzzle which reads, in this land. Only eyes blinded by darkness can see the way. Since the deep ocean is one of the darkest biomes in the world. YouTube commenter Agent Raven also noticed that a lot of the phrasing around the dark worlds appears to be water-based. The fountains, also occasionally called geysers, the phrasing hells or bubbles from the depths, 
The clam girl downer in Undertale who foreshadows Susie. Oh. I knew I shouldn't have cut that from last scripts. Oops. Of course, there's also the fact that you hear Ocean.OGG after you fall and before Chris first wakes up, and the creepy dialogue Onion Sam gives us in Chapter 2, which I covered in my last video. But if this does turn out to be the case, then what's with all the dust? Shouldn't it dissolve in the water? This is super unsettling, why is the dust pulsing like it's breathing? In the next room over a dust was represented by like these cute little bunnies. This feels almost like the true lab which would be an odd thing to have in a school. I feel like Alfie's wouldn't send us here if that were the case. Well, it seems like the users of the room have some influence over the vibes it gives off in the dark world. So probably the first question to ask is, who used this room? The only real life glue we have here is this paper, so let's see. As Gore has paper all over the place, littering his car and also his house, his house also has some pretty creepy vibes. But if he worked with the police, why would he be coming to this closet? A supply closet would usually be managed by a janitor, right? Janitor? Who's the janitor? Oh. No way. Sans? Well let's see. To work at the store in the school, he'd have to be holding down multiple jobs. Check. He is a bit of a mess and leaves paper and stuff lying all over the floor. His door is pretty prevalent in the dark world. And what did Papyrus say in Undertale? It's like another world in there. A world where they don't know how to vacuum. It explains the eyes shrouded by darkness, the lack of walls. Heck maybe locking the door on us is his idea of a prank. Is that why clown keeps being a recurring word highlighted in yellow? Now wait a second, I hear you say, didn't Sans say he just moved here? I mean he did in the sense that he doesn't have many friends, but he does seem to have been here for a while, at the very least long enough to have set up shop, pun intended. In fact, it seems like he's been running it for a while, since Asgore doesn't even have to tell him what he wants anymore, he just already knows it's free pickles. And he knows about Asgore's creepy flower situation. It would also make this line about Papyrus not having any skeletons in his closet, except himself kind of relevant. Maybe he visits Sans at work some days, or maybe he was hiding in a different closet, a closet that can hold a large person. Does Ralsei know? It's not very clear. He does say his prophecy was foretold by time and space which... Is Sans pranking you across time and space? I hate it when he does that. This still raises some questions. Questions like, what the heck is up with all these weird pillars? And why did Sans change his mind regarding us hanging out with Papyrus? Does he know something we don't? Besides, this theory sounds almost too easy. Like it's very easy to support this. There is already a very clear theme of loneliness and friendship, which Papyrus connects to quite readily. I could absolutely see him going around opening up portals thinking he's making lots of new friends by granting sentience to all these poor forgotten items, especially when you think of the way he sort of lives in his brother's shadow amongst the Fandon. If Papyrus is the knight, it makes me wonder what he did to poor Spamton, or if Spamton was already kind of broken when he got there. Wait, hold the flipping phone. So I saw this dialogue encode and thought it was unused, or like maybe there was a SWAT cling standing in front of my room saying this. But this is Jakington's room, which means Spamton didn't share a room with Chris. So, the prestigious big shot, who were they? His name has been erased from the records. Oh crap. Hold on. No. No. This is not another Gaster theory. Get out. Wait, did Gaster literally have a room next to Spamton? No. Get. Ahem. I feel like I should mention that Papyrus actually hasn't had his name spoken in this game yet. Sans always says my brother. So he could be the big shot, or it could be Medidin. Sorry, what were we discussing? Right, this closet. There is another possibility in the form of Jerson. Not only does the CT connect him back to the song from the sea foreshadowing, he was also an author and historian, so it would explain the old papers, and it would explain why his classroom has a door connected to this supply closet. It would also explain the huge pulsing piles of dust, and some of the word writings and images in here. Like if a playing card can become Lancer, I can't imagine what scattered notes regarding the history of humans and monsters would manifest itself as. Also his name anagrams to goners, and being a former smith he probably has a ton of interesting unused tools in here. 
not to mention his son Alvin is a priest, which is probably going to be significant given how often religious terminology and motifs have been coming up in the narrative. And he dropped some interesting foreshadowing about Gerson's hammer at the end of chapter 2. Special thanks to Chesterson Jack for bringing my attention to this theory, go check out the link, because there's actually more to this than I can cover in this quick gloss over. Still not sure what these wobbly things are though. Brooms? Toilet paper? That dangly thing you find in the shower? Light bulbs? Flowey? Onion sends? Tentacles maybe? If it's related to the skeleton bros, maybe it's based on the shower curtain man in the true lab? How is that related to the skeleton bros? Well, Papyrus. Yes, you heard me right. Put down your sans plushie. Papyrus had the theme bone trousel, and the song that plays when you see shower curtain man is Wolfenstein. What happens when you speed up Wolfenstein? That's the background to Bone Trousel. Yeah, that feels like a stretch. If it's related to Jerson, maybe they are mushrooms. Since you find those in Waterfall, wait, the bullets are called spores by this save point. So apparently they are mushrooms, or a mold of some sort. I mean, we have dust, so who knows what else is rotting in here. Actually, wait. What about this creepy music? Is it a late motif? The same way genocide runs too much is for Flowey? Let's speed it up. I don't hear anything odd. The file name is just creepy landscape, but maybe it shows up again in another song? I'm not too musically inclined though so I doubt I'd recognize it even if I saw it. Unless I say, whistled the notes aloud, used a tuning app to identify them, recreated them on piano, and listened to each and every one of the 115 songs in this game. But that would take hours and would not be worth it. Ha, ha ha. Several song filled hours later, Okay, so my mind turned to mush from that, so I just started writing down any song that might have it, and have narrowed it down to these 15 songs. Now we just gotta slowly, painstakingly, compare note by note, and a lot of boring math later. Oh nope, the motif sounds a little similar to the background notes of Don't Forget, but it doesn't seem to be quite the same, which made that a waste of time. Huzzah. I do the same thing with Undertale, but I already know those late motifs by heart, and it's not like I'm going to find it scrolling through the file names wait. Not by late motif, but the name is connected to a particular character in Undertale. How you ask? Well there are three songs specific to this area. Creepy Chase, Creepy Door and Creepy Landscape. You can see that the common word here is creepy. But there is one more song from Undertale with that naming scheme, and that's Creepy Ambience, or as I like to call it. The song that might play when you enter Sans room. That's it for creepy audio from Undertale. Although there is another creepy sound in Deltarune. That would be creepy jingle after interacting with Jevil. That's probably a coincidence but let's look a little closer for funsies. Okay we've peered in at this thing from the light world side, now let's look at it compared to the rest of the dark world. The first thing that jumps out at me is the question mark title at the first save point. That's also the name of Jevil's floor in the basement of the card castle. They both have a sort of purplish floor with cracks in the walls and floors. Interestingly this room uses blue torches like those in Castle Town, instead of the white torches you see in the rest of the castle. In fact this entire castle is black and white except the basement, so there is actually a shift in aesthetics down here which better matches the closet. Rereading Jevil's opening dialogue. I remember at the time being puzzled over the way he phrases this line about freedom. At the time I thought he was referring to the fourth wall. That is to say, he knows this is a video game. But he phrases it so oddly. They lost the chase, and locked up their entire race. Building a prison around the whole world, now I'm the only free one. If the freedom he's referring to is of the mind, it's odd that he's describing it like a physical wall. When Rossi calls him on it, he doesn't say anything about it being a metaphor either. Just that from where he's standing, we're the ones in prisons. Also when we do let ourselves outside, he doesn't actually tell us this is a video game or anything of that nature, so if he's referring to a mind prison, it's odd he didn't follow up on his promise to show us freedom. But, what if he's referring to the actual physical space he's in? What if there's something special about these three spaces, 
What if we really are letting ourselves outside? I can't help but notice this cell isn't really sitting on solid ground either. Like we head down these stairs, and then you can see this little line here indicating that the platform this floor is sitting upon is ending. Yet there's still a walkway here? This room is out of bounds is what I'm saying, or at the very least it's spitting in the face of physics, which, I mean, it's Jevil so fair. But if it's out of bounds, that wouldn't make it the only one. We've mentioned the room in between a few times in this context, but did you know there's actually a sprite that shows up specifically for when party members go out of bounds? It's this one here called Magic Glass, but it actually shows up in a non-game breaking scenario too. You know where. Bam. The closet. The key to Jevil's room is also hidden from the eyes, which is a reference to Shalm keeping it a secret from us, but also the walk where the stars don't shine hint. That in itself is also alluding to the concept of something out of bounds as the path cuts through what the game has already set up as solid wall. But that puzzle and wording also call back to this eye puzzle. In this land, only eyes blinded by darkness can see the way. Looking at our other secret boss basement for a second, Swatch also acts like the basement in his castle doesn't exist, adding to the unseen metaphor. Actually wait a second, let's back up a bit and talk about Shalm. Their house isn't just out of bounds here, it's sewn into the fabric of the darkness around it. Look at those stitch marks. This shop is literally resting upon the seam of reality. Shom does say they match Jevil in the games they play, and is also constantly hinting that they know what's going on here. I just realized that, Gash weaves down as if you cry, text could be referring to Shom or Jevil as well. Actually here's a question. If the basements are connected to the out of bounds space, is this darker square on the wall of your cell intentional or am I just jumping at shadows here? Pun intended. If darkness is what gives darkness their form, then I'd expect them to be more powerful in darker parts of the room. So is there anything about these three spaces and their light world counterparts that makes them darker yet darker? We don't know what the closet looks like, but if this cabinet is the card castle, and shelves are the floors, then the basement must be this crawl space beneath the cabinet. That's definitely a darker space, I can almost imagine kids looking under there with flashlights for lost toys and such, but what about Spamton's basement? Well once again, the castle appears to be the cabinet, so that would make the basement the space beneath it. That's kind of fascinating, because that might mean the Neo body was less of a robot or costume, and more of a drawing or a printout since it's hard to imagine anything too big under here. So I'd say a literal interpretation of Jevil's words is shockingly kind of plausible. I know everyone's imagining Spamton was corrupted by the night, or by Gaster. But I can't help but notice that the basement is what they sealed away, with encryption and force fields. It's almost like there's something about this space itself that they're afraid of. It's interesting when you compare the way these two spaces are locked off to Ralsei's kingdom, because all of Ralsei's houses are locked up too, as are many of the rooms in the castle, and, most notably, the great door, which he implied he locked specifically to keep other darkeners out. That's pretty weird when you remember how lonely he is. I wonder how long Ralsei has been here? He acts like he's been waiting for a while, given that he prepared a manual for you, and a speech, and a training dummy. He claims he's been waiting his entire life to meet us and built this custom rooms like Queen. I often see people wondering how darkners can have rich backstories dating back decades if their dark fountains just spawn recently, but I think the answer to that is that even when they're just normal objects in the light world they still have some kind of sentience or awareness that's being shaped by the lightners around them. This explains why Queen would know the characters of the card kingdom. She's a laptop, laptops are portable, Original artwork shows she was planned to be a calculator, that's even more portable and likely to end up in a children's classroom. It also explains why the King of Spades is bitter about being tossed aside and left in the dark. He's lamenting the fact that no one uses this classroom or plays with these toys anymore. As a storage closet with no other natural denizens, this seems to be more of a storage space where objects and beings from other worlds may come to reside. So I can't help but wonder if the real reason Ralsei wants us to recruit as many people as we can is to just help him stave off loneliness. Loneliness does appear to be the other thread tying these three spaces together. Jevil is lonely in his freedom, Ralsei is literally the lonely prince, and Spamton was abandoned by his friends after he became a big shot. Also these wobbly things sitting all alone on their little islands, waving to us as we pass, and, you know, 
the person in the unused dialogue wondering why they're alone. If we look at the way Raal C words his prophecy, he says that the world will crack with fear, the earth will draw her final breath, and only then will three heroes appear at the world's edge. So are we here early? Or is the calamity already occurring? Though this area is called creepy landscape in some of the Ross, it's also called cliffs in others. I don't know about you, but cliffs definitely sounds like another way to say the world's edge to me. Given the eyes here match the eyes of the Titans, I do think it's plausible that this dark world will be one of the final levels of the game. This whole area screams end of the world, with cracked ground, toppling pillars, deserted towns, and piles and piles of dust. Plus Lancer appears to go through a loading zone up here, so the mapping vaguely implies the existence of more areas that we might get to explore later. In addition, Suzir remarks that this place looks like an abandoned amusement park. I personally don't see it, but I do see a merry-go-round in the background of Jevil's room, and in this attack. And in Chapter 2, there's an NPC that mentions Spampton, stopping the construction of a merry-go-round because he's afraid of clowns. And what's this over Spampton's shop? Support beams for roller coasters? Spamton comes up in connection with roller coasters a lot. He actually pulls you onto roller coasters to start the battle. Some of his attacks ride on roller coasters, and the background of his battle shows what looks like an abandoned theme park. There's also the teacup rides which you find in every part of the cyber world from the fields, to the castle, to the basement, which is apparently privately owned. I wonder how all of this is going to tie into the festival, or what happened to Chris, Asriel, and Noel at the previous festivals. I mean aside from terrorizing Noel on the Ferris wheel. The mayor has been fixating on set festival for the last two chapters, so it definitely seems like these two themes are going to converge near the end of the game, when the whole town becomes a carnival, and I am absolutely here for it. Phew. I imagine some of you are wondering what's been taking so long. Was it just the holidays? Well. Oh my god. Just let me monetize. What? Now? Stop 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 stop. Damn it doggo, they're good kitties. Why I I I I I I I I Help 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 help. Please. I can't do this alone. Please. Oh thank god. We finally did it. Yay. I'm. I'm just gonna. Ugh. I'm not burned out or anything. I'm just exhausted. Sleepy HBC gets floor naps. The nice thing about finally being monetized is I can start alternating between the longer theory videos like this one and some smaller fun ones that wouldn't be long enough to justify Patreon funding. I'm probably gonna make some of those before I delve back into something this big again. But before I do, there's something I need to do. I made this account as a very sheltered kid. At the time, I didn't understand the implications of my channel name. It's been making it a bit uncomfortable when I try to interact with other channels and such. I don't want to confuse people by making a huge radical name change, but I still want to tweak this just a little bit more. And while I was still in monetization limbo, that wouldn't have been a safe option. But now that we're in the clear, I think I'm ready. I'm ready to take this to the next level. With the legal help of FairTube, the financial support of my patrons, and most of all, the collective hopes and dreams of all my viewers, I shall forge my name anew. By this power, I shall become... Bread. <laughs> While I take floor naps, what do you guys think about the first dark world? Is Sans secretly the school janitor? Is he just a red herring to distract from Jerson? Are the basements and their spooky bosses connected to the closet, or am I just jumping at shadows? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments. I just realized we have access to Lynx now. No not that cunt. Lynx is very cute, but he can be a bit distracting, so for now. I'm going to add him to the Patreon exclusive version. So here are some links to advertise my links. 